I teach an ECSE class, Renee. Renee teaches as well. Uh, Devin Aiken teaches another one. Renee will be teaching in uh, Spanish. Uh, I think in 2016 we have 44 ECSE classes scheduled. So there's, a, it's a, there's a lot of people who want to learn. So I thought I'd share with you just a little bit of our three-day class. In 2016 it's moving to a four-day class because there's a lot more to, to learn and cover. The idea is to have you learn how to design wireless networks. And we just happen to use Eka how to do it with. The real idea is learning to design networks correctly. The process of designing a network should not be based on anything except for meeting the requirements. You have to know what the requirements are. If you know what the requirements are, then you use the tool to help you meet those requirements. Uh, some of you will be coming to the ECSE class next week. So because of, I mean, two weeks in Denmark. So because I know some of you are coming, I'm going to not do some things because I want you to be surprised when you're actually in class. I'm going to pick up just a couple of things that we cover in class that are kind of aha moments for folks. First, note I haven't even started ESS yet. Before you start ESS, you want to go and use your Wi-Fi adapter and connect up to a network. Now the reason we want to do this before is the internal NIC is going to be doing the ACT survey. It needs to pick up DHCP, DNS, default gateway, subnet masks, all those pieces. And in order to do that, we have to let the Windows NIC driver do its job. Once Ekahal kicks in, it's going to try to talk to that. So if you haven't done this step first, start ESS, ESS will control your NIC. Not very well because like they talked about earlier, they don't have the correct drivers to make the NIC do everything you need it to do. So this step you do before. Then you're going to start the software. And because I started the software already, you'll note when it comes up, lovely Windows. Note I'm using a Mac, but I'm running Windows on it for a while. <laughs> Tell when Miko gets his act together and makes it work. So uh, for class, I, when I teach, I run it in boot camp because this next thing I'm going to show you. I want, if I'm in boot camp, that means the internal NIC is available to Windows. And so now Ekaha has access to it so I can do an active survey with the internal NIC. I really like the Mac internal NICs. I can get AC. If I use VM, uh, actually, I'm a Parallels guy. I don't like VMware as much. So when I run in either either of those two, the internal NIC gets virtualized, and then Ekahal can't see the Wi-Fi-ness. It just looks like Ethernet. And then you have to use an external one. I use this little teeny Linksys. <laughs> and so if I'm running a VM and I need an active survey, I just plug this guy in. And then I just happen, I use him for a couple reasons. One, it works with OmniPeak, so I use it for that. But it's also um, AC, single stream. But Windows finds drivers for it every time. <laughs> I mean, part of finding Wi-Fi NICs, if your Windows drivers can't see it, it's no point. So if I'm running a VM, I'll use an extra one here. So you can see right now, I have a passive survey going. If I look at the passive survey, and I try to control it, there's no control. That's because Ekahau doesn't have access to the actual NIC itself. It is, well, this weird headphone thing. Um, Ekahau is using Windows to talk to the NIC. And so Windows doesn't have the level of control we need. So the passive survey by default is working. It's bringing in data. We can see right now, this is what I'm actually hearing live. The amount of time it's taking is about three seconds. No, two and a half seconds. No, three seconds. No, one and a half seconds. No, and it's random. There's no rhyme or reason to how Windows is doing its thing underneath. Which is why, though we have a passive survey, this is not an ideal way to bring in data. So, I'm going to show you to do, I've got a USB NIC in here. Here's a 
Well, this one is an official Ekahau neck because it's gray plastic. This is a Proxim neck. It is way different. It has tan plastic. Different plastic. Insides are the same. So I'm going to plug in one. The computer went dung dung. This is always fun while you wait for the USB to do their job. OK, so what happened is uh, automatically, Ekao said, oh, I see a NIC that has the ability for me to control it. NIC 300, we have drivers for it. And the internal NIC can now do an active survey. And I can do a ping or a throughput test. And I'm using the internal NIC. Right now, if I pinged anyone, what's the ping address it would ping? Which default gateway? The one on the SAD that I joined before I even started Ekaha. It happened to be conference Wi-Fi, so wherever that default gateway is, that's what would be populated here if I chose ping. So that's where that one comes from. Note my single NIC here is now under control. I can control where it goes. It uses all the channels on 2.4, all the channels on 5 gig. Together, it takes about, if I look at it, about four and a half seconds to scan through all of them. It's going to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 36, 40, 44, and it scans through all of them about four, four and a half seconds. If I want to speed that up, I can do two things. I can go into this and say, sorry, I only want to scan 1611. And over here, I only want uni1 and uni2. Sorry, turn them all off first. Uni1 and uni2. And if that was what I told my NIC to do, if we wait for it over here, you'll see, now it does all of those channels in one and a half seconds. So now I'm collecting data much, much faster because I'm only collecting the data for the channels that I want. So scan the channels you want. Don't waste the time scan the channels you don't want. There is an easier way, but it costs some money. So let me reset this back to all in all. So now, four and a half seconds, all the 2.4, all the 5 gig. I take another NIC. Don't worry, you can still buy these. And plug it in. Automatically, Akihau senses, I now have two. And it says, well, if I have two, let's dedicate one to 2.4. And we'll take the second one and dedicate it to 5 gig. The 2.4. I need to change my pattern because I need to match the timing of USB here. Come on. Oh, that was the USB I'm not happy sound. It should come back. Yeah. Yeah, my USB's not really happy right now. There we go. And it said 2.4 is now 2.4 only and the five gig is turned off. And on the other one, it automatically went to five gig. And all the five gig channels are there. If you have another NIC, you plug it in, and it goes two, four, lower five, upper five. So with three NICs, I can scan all channels in about a second and a half. If I only have one NIC, then you kind of need to pare down the channels that you're scanning to be as close as possible. You can walk as, you know, no matter how fast you walk, the speed of light's going to beat you. So it's not how fast you walk for compare. So if I'm here and a second and a half later, I'm somewhere else, that AP I can still see. I have not lost any data from any AP because they are all speed of light. What is is I click, I collect channel one. I don't collect another new channel one for a second and a half. But all the channel ones I see. It's not like I'm missing something. It's just I don't get another channel one shot for another second and a half. So more NICs, the better. Mika, what happens if you put in five NICs? Yeah. 
So the first three are the only ones that count. After that, yeah. Uh, part of it is also because of the USB bus pulls power and every nick draws more power. Uh, I've had trouble with my Surface Pro 3 for USB power. It, can, it, it sometimes can take only one nick, and then I put the second nick in and the power freaks out. And you'll hear that ba-da-da -da sound. Okay, so that was one thing I wanted to cover, was why you need to have more NICs. Second thing, difference between an active and a passive survey. Passive survey, the NIC is sitting there listening to all the channels we told it to scan, 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 listen to another channel. I'm listening to radio tap header, frame. I'm getting signal, noise, signal, ratio, time stamp, channel stamp, date stamp, all that information, plus the packet header where the beacon says I'm transmitting on channel four. Now I might have heard him on channel three in the radio tap header, but I got that he's on channel four. All that data gets saved in the data ball. Great. It collects all data from all beacons. If I go to an active survey, the internal NIC is connecting to one AP. Which AP? Okay, that's the part where I ask a question and you answer. Whichever one you joined in Windows until you roamed. And then whenever and wherever you roam, I will be now collecting one, just a different one than over here. Active surveys are terrible. I know everyone loves to talk about active surveys. I'm trying to tell you the truth here. Active surveys are terrible because they only collect one AP's data. Which AP? The one that you're associated to now. Now, if I was walking around and I connect to you, and I walk past two, three, four AP, and I was 54, 48, 36, 2, 1, and I'm all the way over here, and this speaker is another AP, and I finally roam. This spot right here in an active survey looks bad. Because if I looked at its data rate, slow. But what's my RSSI over there? From him, bad. From the guy where I was, good. The problem with active surveys is they show you what, not where. And yet we paint the what in a where picture, and we give our customers this heat map, and they go, oh, that's a bad place. And there's nothing wrong with the place. Same with any of the tools, any of the visualizations that use active survey data, throughput, jitter, ping. What's my ping time going to be over there? As good as it was here. And yet, because I roamed over there, still associated to you, that looks like a bad place. Bad ping times. Round trip times are terrible. Is that a bad place? Well, maybe if I started here and I walked there with the laptop that I had at the time and the load was on the network and there's if, 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 if all those were in place, then for that one device, that's a bad place. But when we print it and show the heat map to our customers, all they see is, oh. be careful when you use active surveys for visualizations. They will show you things that happened, totally true, they're not lying, but it's true for that one device on that one path on that one day with that one load. True. Uh, another example, I did a survey for a customer and they had this huge chunk of area that had not, not bad round trip times, zero round trip times. Ping stopped. I'm giving the presentation afterwards, and I'm like, you know, this whole idea about roaming and bad, and they said, yeah, but that's terrible. You didn't get any pings. And one of the guys at the desk goes, ping? You were pinging? I said, yeah. Oh, we thought that was ICMP attack. I turned off ICMP. <laughs> Which you laugh because you knew exactly what happened, but from their standpoint, if that, that one IT guy was in the room, the other people were like, oh, bad. Look at that. We can't even ping. And it was, you're actually testing something else. Or, am I the one making noise or is it that other mic?
sure. I was seeing if it was my heart or not. Uh, where's UC? Did you UC? Did you turn off that mic? Oh, I still hear it. Anyway. Uh, So there's a little button on, oh, okay. Oh, it's still on, that's the problem, okay. It's on the button. Oh, I feel so much better now. Okay, question again. Act, you, the question was, active survey is only good if you stay in one place. No, active surveys are good, they collect data. I mean, every place I can go, I'm getting data. A Couple issues though, is what if I did that roam I just described? And I was over here and I was connected to Martin, and I finally get right over here and I roam. And I stay data on you. Now when I plot it out, this AP looks like a yin yang symbol. He has a tail. Okay, you're a bunch of guys, I'll call it. It looks like sperm, you know. There's a, a dot and then a long tail, and the tail goes in the direction of travel. Well, had I walked the path the other direction, the yin yang symbol would go the other way. Well, which one's correct? So for an active survey, I need to go connect, you, turn off roaming, walk until I get to the edge, and walk to every edge on you. And then I have one great set of data for one AP. And then I do it again on the next AP. Walk, 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 and next AP. So active surveys aren't bad. Active surveys are fantastic. To do them right is very expensive. The last time I had a client pay me to do an active survey eight years ago? Because I have a very simple thing. You want act passive survey costs X, active survey costs 5X. And they kind of go, what? Yeah, because really it takes me more than five times longer to do correct active surveys. And what you end up giving your customers is you do a passive survey and then you do an active along the way and then they believe that the active is actually showing them all the data and you only have a couple of APs worth of active data. It's a nice statistical sample. I love statistics. My MBA's emphasis was on quantitative analysis, and I think statistics are wonderful. As long as your customer knows, the active surveys are a statistical sample, whereas the passive collects everything. I don't. Yeah, I mean, so if you, if you do give it, just to, I explained it to you fairly fast. If you can explain that to your customers and they understand it, then it makes sense to talk about that. Oh, so he, the question was, if we have a single AP active survey, how do we ever test roaming? You don't. You have to test roaming with multiple APs. But then remember where you roam is highly dependent on when, the path, the load, all those other features come into bear at the same time. And, you, and it's your client. Your client might actually roam someplace else. How many of you use Air Magnet? I, I taught Air Magnet for 12 years. Love Air Magnet, it's great. So, I, I'm, okay, I like Echo better, but Air Magnet had in their active survey a roaming dial. You could say roam more aggressive because you wanted to force the roams to happen sooner. The problem with that is, is it reality? Do clients actually roam sooner? Or do you get sticky clients? Or do you get clients in 2.4? Or the max get on 5 gig rather than 2.4 by an 8 dB differential? There's so many variables in there any active survey is just going to be one snapshot in time on one path. So I don't want to discount that they're not valuable. Just know what you're looking at when you go see them. So when, do you, when do you not ignore the fact that it's dropping back? When do I ignore? Uh, I don't ever worry. That's, that's ping, that's upper layer. Okay, let me back up one thing. How many of you have ever specified gig to the desktop? What kind of cable do you use for gig to the desktop? 5E. 5E. Six if you have some money and you don't like your fingertips. Yeah, a couple weeks ago a friend of mine said, yeah, can you come punch, you know, make some cable heads? I'm like, I can do that, I've done thousands. 
that cat's six cable look. Who made that stuff? They're like a sadist. They don't straighten out, your fingertips hurt. Anyway, so you need Cat5 cable. When you say Cat5, 5E, it actually includes a whole less of requirements. Very tight specifications. Pinouts, twist ratios even. Yeah, we all know the 100 meter distance, but it also has near side crosstalk, far side crosstalk. All of those go into B Cat6. And if you gave Cat6 spec cables and you verified them, how often does gig work? All the time. Why? Because you're meeting its spec. So for physical layer, for the phi layer, if you meet the phi layer's requirements, you get what you ask for. Our problem with Wi-Fi and designing for Wi-Fi is we found that. What are the phi layer requirements for Cisco Voice? If you meet Cisco Voice's phi layer requirements, crazy thing happens. Cisco Voice works. How often? Every time. Wouldn't it be nice if our design worked every single time? Anyone ever have someone complain that their Wi-Fi is slow? Every time I've been called, I do about a third of my time new designs, a third of my time teaching other people how to do designs, and a third of my time doing fixing people's bad designs. That's broken. So when I go to fix a bad design, the complaints are always, oh, that works slow. Really? The network did exactly what the designers programmed it to do. They left on one megabit data. So you connected at one megabit data? Yes. The Wi-Fi did its job. It connected at one megabit. Well, we don't like that. Well, then why did you design it? We didn't mean to. Well, if you leave on one megabit data rates and you connect to one megabit data rates, the network is not slow. The network is meeting requirements. So when your users complain, well, who do they complain to? The guy who designed the slow network. Wi-Fi is incredibly resilient. If you allow it to be what it's designed to be, by nature, it's slow. It's coded to be slow. It goes 256, QAM 64, 16, 4, 2, 1. And when you're at BPSK at one megabit and it works, you should be clapping. Those engineers built resilient networks. It did exactly what it was programmed to do. If you don't like that, why did you design it that way? If you want it to be something else, well, design it to be something else. Okay, let's go through a, a design process. I'm just gonna bring up a quick little uh, school project. Designing for requirements. So first we have to know what the requirements are. What's the first requirement for a CAT 5E cable? The one you must have. Continuity, right? Electrons have to flow from one end to the other. If they don't flow, then it doesn't matter what all the other specs are. You have to have continuity. What is the minimum requirement for a Wi-Fi? RSSI. You must have radio waves that hit strong enough to trigger and get a bit to go inside the NIC. So you must have RSSI. RSSI is to Wi-Fi what continuity is to cable. Required, mandatory, must be there, not sufficient. If all we needed in Cat5 was continuity, we could run Ethernet on twisted pair barbed wire. Now, I actually have run Ethernet 10 base T over barbed wire, about half a meter. Because the near side crosstalk, infinite, because they, they touch. But 10 base T actually runs on about this long of barbed wire. So continuity is required, but it's not sufficient. We have to have those other requirements. We need to know what those other requirements are. Let's think through Cat 6 again. Cat 5E, whatever your choice is. <coughs> continuity, required. Near side crosstalk, far side crosstalk, pinouts, twist ratios, length, all of those issues come into bear. Need to have all of them. From Cat 3 to Cat 5 to 5E to 6 to 7, did continuity ever change? No. Did the copper 
get better? Do they mine a special Cat 7 copper? <laughs> Cat 6 copper any better than Cat 5e copper? No, we got faster speeds not by increasing the flow of electrons through Cat 5 cable. We got it by lowering interference. Near side cross sock, far side cross sock, 10 meg, pretty big interference. 100 meg less, gig less. We get less interference by the twist ratios and all those other issues. For Wi-Fi, continuity is RSSI. We must have RSSI to go faster, lower interference. Same thing to go faster on ca cable, to go faster on Wi-Fi, we have to lower interference. What's the number one interferer on a wireless LAN? The wireless LAN. So if in our requirements we say we need RSSI of NIG 67 to meet Cisco spec, the rest of the spec says we need to have no co-channel interference of greater than 86. Now where did I make that up? I didn't make it up. The Cisco voice guy said, oh, we need 67, but we need 19 dB differential be before the next guy is on the same channel. So in our requirements, when we're designing, we have to meet a primary goal. We also have to meet our co-channel interference goal. What happens if you don't meet your co-channel interference goal? Your network is slow. I mean, that's, I mean, if you didn't meet your co-channel interference goal on cable and you used, instead of twisted pair cable, phone, the little silver satin cable that's flat for phones, and you ran Ethernet over it, it would be slow. Why? Because you're not meeting the co-channel interference goals. Well, we don't call them co-channel interference. It's called near-side crosstalk on cable. So we need to know what our requirements are. We need to put the requirements in the beginning. And then when we design, we need to design to meet those requirements. Let's walk through and do a little bit here. Let me try one. Let's see if I can, uh, come on. Uh, by the way, this is a survey done on a Segway. I gotta tell you. Doing surveys on a Segway, the only way to do a survey. Now, how many of you think your boss would buy you a Segway? <laughs> they're, they're about 6,000 euro. Do you think your boss would buy you a 6,000 euro Segway? What is the minimum ROI to buy a capital investment in your company? A year, two years, 18 months, six months? I mean, your finance department has some return on investment that says, if we can get our money back and start making money after X number of months. This Segway paid for itself in four days. If you went to your boss and said, I can get the money back in four days. What about handicapped people? The Segway goes anywhere a wheelchair goes. Actually, it goes more places than a wheelchair goes. And it can go over curbs pretty easy, down. Uh, up curbs, you gotta step off for a minute. But anyway, the reason I've even brought that up is I wanna show you, see how clean, let me turn this off for a second. Uh, look at those straight lines of doing that, that survey. That's what happens when you use a Segway. You can very, it, it's actually the easiest, best way to do surveys because you have very stable. It's me driver. I'm clicking, yeah, because it's really hard to get GPS indoor. If I could, I would. And then I'd put, I'd put on a little Roomba, you know, the little Roomba vacuum cleaners, put my laptop on there and say, go, clean the room. And it just, but. <laughs> We, we don't have that, so that, 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 that would be nice. Yeah, I mean, you could do drone, you could do all sorts of things. I mean, if you wanted to make this happen, it would be great. Okay, if I wanted to design this, I, the first step is I would have to put in walls, right? Now, I get people all the time who say, Keith, I hate drawn walls, they take forever. 
Really? In fact, I used to think they took forever, and so I hired some virtual assistants in the Philippines who are, you know, opposite side of the world from me. So during the day, I would collect the data, I would send them the uh, file over my sleep, they would be awake, and they would draw the walls for me, and then only charged me like, you know, 10 euros an hour. Great. I got stuck one day during the day, so they, I couldn't access them because it was their night. I got stuck and I had to do 1.4 million square feet on a project, and they were going to pay a lot of money, but it had to be done in the next four hours. And so I just sat down and did it. And I realized, it's not that big of a deal. You just sit and draw your walls. Now, the question is, what wall to draw? Tomorrow, Frené is going to give a little uh, talk, a little 10 talk, on how to measure a wall. And one of the tricks in measuring walls is you don't put the AP near the wall. If it's too close to the wall, you're measuring free space loss, and free space loss is one of those exponential curves. And if you're inside a meter from a, any AP, you're in its exponential curve, meaning if you breathe, you lose a dB or two. If you move it three centimeters, you might drop five dB in this far. So just moving changes the dB. So you need to be far enough out, and I, I want to take Fernay's thunder on that. But you want to measure your walls. Some people like that I carry lots of tools because I'm a gadget man. So, gadget man, you need one of these. Okay, it doesn't have to be fluke. It's a laser meter. Let me answer and then I'll answer a question. And it tells me how far things are. Now this one's millimeter accuracy out to 200 meters. Costs 400 euro though, so you, you, I'm not saying you should get this one. Well, the cool part about this one, you can be outside a building and go bottom of the building, second floor, and it'll tell me how high it is, because it has trigonometry built in. And it's incredibly accurate. But for less than 100 euro, you can get one that's uh, half a centimeter resolution, which is more than enough for us. Question? Yes, where's Miko? Wow, isn't that a cool name for it? I, I forget, I just call it wow. Wonders of walls or wall outline wizard. Oh, that sounds so boring. It should be like the wonderment of walls. Um, works if you have really good CAD files and they have the right layers, you assign a type of wall in the layer to a type of wall in Ekehau and that looks them up and it's smart enough to say, oh, the door's open, let's close the door. So that's kind of cool. It works really well if you have a good CAD. If you have a bad CAD, you'll spend more time fixing it. Yes, if you know AutoCAD, it makes it easier. If you don't know AutoCAD, then you have to learn that, plus layering, plus other things. So, sometimes, I've found some architects, if you get them, they're really anal, and layer zero is always this, layer one is always this. They always remember to do things right. So if you have a clean CAD, wow, it works wonders. If you don't, wow, works. And worst case, you just draw them yourself, dude. It doesn't take that long to draw them all. I'm, I've timed myself. I can do about, I'm trying to do square meters of square <laughs> feet in my head. Uh, I can do about 1,000 square meters every seven to eight minutes. So 10,000 square meters in under an hour so it's not that bad. So you just draw a bunch of walls. When you're done drawing walls, wall, 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 you're all done. Now you're ready to answer the question. So what's the first question we need? What is the minimum requirement we need? RSSI. So you need to pick the correct AP you're going to use when you start placing them. So let's pretend I drew all the walls. I didn't, but we'll just pretend here for a minute. I'll draw a couple so there's something to make this signal do weird things. And I really like it when everyone watches me draw walls because it's really, it's really fun, you know. <laughs> I'm just going to put enough here so something happens. Okay. You must pick the correct, yes, I don't know.
You mean like this? And then you hold the control key down and you can go to one degree. You can do anything you want. If you hold the control key off, it jumps and you jump by 15 degrees. So if there's a 15 degree kind of a dent, you know, indent as you move, if you want the dent to release, you can go anywhere, just hold the control key down. Yeah. Oh, then you just leave your finger on the control key. <laughs> yes. You mean this down? Uh, you mean something that might have looked like... Like a curve? Hold that question, I'll get it to you in a second. It, you still have, you have to do the same kind of thing, segment, 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 but now you're talking about you're changing the segment height. And we'll also how to do that. So, you draw on the walls, you must write AP. There's a whole bunch of other things in, in class we go through the whole bit, I'm just gonna jump ahead, yes. I can edit it right here and say that color isn't 12 dB, I want it to be 8. Okay? That's really, that's good. I mean, that's a, that, that wall will really stop the RF. Uh, how long ago this? It's 7, when did the edit come in? 7, 6 or something? Yeah, but it's, it's been around for a while, the edit. Before, you had to go in and edit an actual comp file, and you could, they were just XML, you could put them in there, but now it's, it's like in the front for you to play with. Okay, so here's the trick when you want to go design. You have to pick the right AP, which is why I lobby Miko back there to make that go away. Can any of you buy a generic AP? I mean, Tisco might. They come in a white box with a black barcode on it. If you can't in, buy one, this is, I, I, know what, I know what Miko and his team were thinking of. Let's just put a generic one in. If people don't know, let's just do it. But since you can't buy one, you can't actually design with one. I had a customer say, oh, yeah, can you design me for uh, Aerohive? And I gave them the Aerohive design. They said, oh, it's okay. We put in Ruckus. And I went, it's not going to work. They call me up like a month later. Your stupid design didn't work. And I say, you mean the design I made for Aerohive that you put in Ruckus? Well, yeah, an AP is an AP. Nope, they're not the AP. In fact, a Cisco 2700 and a Cisco 3700, you'll get a different AP count. Why? Because if you design to meet specs, primary signal strength, secondary signal strength, co-channel interference, by the way, and in that order, then you'll find you may or may not need to have a different count, AP count because either it meets the goal or it doesn't. When you're pulling cat six cable, are you going to pull cat six to every cube or every other cube? It's a different requirement, so you, do, you act differently. A 2700 is a different AP than a 3700. So we do them different. So first, you have to pick the AP you want, and then you come down and say, I need to set some requirements. Well, what kind of requirements do I want? I could have Cisco voice requirements. I could have location tracking. I could make my own. I could take one that somebody else already had and duplicate it and change it to Keith Special. Do you have your oh, now, finish, now the first half of the sentence, the answer was yes. The second half of the sentence was no, uh, unless you want to be my customer. I mean, for, I will give you yours for your, your requirement. They're actually unique for every customer. The, you know, if the customer's running Cisco Voice, I might start with this voice, but they say, yeah, we want Cisco Voice, but we also have Vocera badges, and it's, it's an editable thing. Today, sad as it is, we do not have a TIA, EIA in the Wi-Fi industry. I wish we did. They made CAT 5E, 
And so when you go to your cable vendor, you just say four letters, cat, actually five, cat five E. Well, you could get away with just four, cat five, cat six. And then your cable vendor does it, he measures it, it meets, and it does what you want it to do. In Wi-Fi, there is no voice grade Wi-Fi. Yeah, there should be, and hopefully we can get to some point where you can, but right now, they're individualized, and either you meet the requirement or you don't. So let's say our requirement here is we want NAG 67, we want an SNR of 25, we want a data rate of at least, uh, I don't know, 24, and I'm just making this up. I want two APs at, let's make this, at, where's Martin? Martin, what's ASCOM's backup? Six, 65, 67? I forget what they are. Between the primary and the secondary? Oh, so let's go 67 and 73 then. Okay. Now note, I asked the vendor. That's where you get these from. You don't make them up. The customer says, we want Cisco Voice. Then you go to Cisco Voice and find out what the spec is. Since we don't have TIA, EIA to give us a spec, you find the device you're designing for that's the most stringent. Now, what if you're designing for a school? Um, it might not be Voice. It might be a Chromebook. Find the one you're after. And if you don't know, pick a hard one. Uh, anybody design K-12? I, I do. I have a, a shortcut for K-12. Ready? Here is my K-12. I just go primary at 65, secondary at 65, no channel overlap within 82. Okay? Why 82? 82 is the threshold for CCA preamble detect. You know the difference between preamble detect and energy detect? So preamble detect is the chip is about to transmit a frame. Before it can transmit a frame, it hears someone else on Wi-Fi on the same channel greater than 82, so it'll defer. So that's kind of a threshold. The other threshold is ED, or energy detect. It's 20 to be lower, or 62. So at 62, a uh, microwave oven will be loud enough to make me stop. If you noticed on John Anderson's presentation this morning, just because the microwave was there did not stop Wi-Fi. If it didn't break ED, energy detect, Wi-Fi still transmitted. And half the time, we got our packets through. Whereas that little teeny skinny phone was loud enough to break energy detect. So the AP went to transmit and said, oh, somebody's using my frequency, and stopped. And we had 100% loss from a little teeny skinny phone that hardly did anything. The microwave took half the frequency, but it wasn't loud enough to stop ED. Whereas Wi-Fi stops at pre PD, or preamble detect. So we have to design for preamble detect. If you do this for, for uh, K-12, you will have a minimum of four radios in every classroom. Two five gigs, two two fours, and I don't know any classroom for K-12 that can handle, that needs more than four radio coverage. So anyway, let's pretend this is a school. We want to go with this thing. I do this. I like change it. Oh, I'll get you a second. I change this to something like, I don't know, a thousand, and I'll accept a hundred percent packet loss. Now, why do I do that? The last two little things. Anyone? I don't want to see this guy go red. Because <laughs> while I'm doing a survey, if it doesn't meet my requirement, it goes red and it's distracting. So if I make the requirement like extraordinary, then it never trips. OK, so there's my requirements. Now, the first requirement is I need to have coverage, minimum requirement. So we grab an AP, take an AP, and say, what if I had an AP right here? Show me. And I think I should have started on an empty screen because that was all, everyone. Yeah, okay. So there's the coverage for that AP on that location with those 8 dB walls and the scale that's there. And this little guy right here, uh, on the USB stick, there's a folder called Keith's white papers. One of the white paper is entitled Want, Don't Want, Don't Care. This is Want, Don't Want, Don't Care. So 65, 
that's what I want. I set it as my requirement. I need 65. If it gets below 82, I don't care anymore. So this is want, this is don't want, and this is I don't care. So now where it's green is meets my requirement. Where it's gray, it doesn't meet my requirement, but it's causing co-channel interference. It's showing me where my co-channel interference zone is. So if I take another AP and I drop the second one over here, hold on a second, when it's done, I'm gonna have to click it to select, come on. So that's the coverage of that one. Now this is how I design from the rest of the school. I switch from primary coverage, which is easy. Coverage is easy. You want more coverage, what do you do? Add more APs. You don't want to add more APs? Add more power. Let's add some power here. I don't want that guy to be a measly 25. I want to go 100. Yeah. And by the way, I'm, I happen to pick uh, ruckus APs, which usually I leave them at 100 because the way ruckus plays, that it works really well. So you set more APs, more power, they want coverage. But what we really have a harder time designing for are the next two requirements. First requirement was coverage, fairly easy. Second requirement is secondary coverage. You come to options, you go to secondary. And now this is showing me everywhere where I have two that meet my requirement. In this case, two, four, and five. Well, I want it to show me where I have two, two fours. So I have to turn off the five. That is the area where there's two, two fours greater than 65. What do you think the five gig is gonna look like? Now, watch what happens when I do something called sensitivity analysis. Yeah, again, my MBA was in quantitative analysis, so one of the things we would do looking at stock prices, little buyouts, we had like hundreds of case studies in a couple years, was something called sensitivity analysis when we said, if X company was gonna buy B company, at what point should they stop buying? Can they negotiate down to some point? How brittle is the design? In this case, I can take these walls and say, for that type of wall, those walls there, what if I changed it to a drywall instead? Sorry, this takes a while. Little T MacBook Air, very good for doing data collection, not so good for doing data analysis. <laughs> Same data, same predictive model. What I did was I changed all the walls at the same time. So say you're on site, you go through and you measure and you say, oh, that wall is a 6 dB wall, that's a 6 dB wall, you put them all in, and you, wanna, and you say, I, I designed this, it meets all the requirements, but what if I was wrong? What if it wasn't a 6, it was a 5, or it was a 7? So you come in and you change it and you say, what if it wasn't a three, it was a five? Would I still meet my goals? And you can quickly, uh, for anybody who's in photography, we call this bracketing. You would set a little bracket, you take a picture and it takes f-stop and then up an f-stop and down an f-stop all in three really quickly. What we're doing here is we're doing sensitivity analysis. If your design works with walls of six, run it at walls of eight and see if it really breaks your network. Now note, I'm designing in second. So if I added another AP, I stay in the second mode because primary coverage is easy. Now watch when I add one all the way over here. Sorry, again, the delay, I've got a full set of actual collected data underneath. I just picked the wrong one to play with here. So if I select this one, it's now showing me where I have double coverage not primary coverage, only secondary coverage, because that's the hard one. Primary coverage is easy. If I switch this back to primary, you'll see how much bigger the, sink, the primaries are. 
Anybody can design for primary. I stay in secondary mode because that's the difficult one to hit to make sure, especially if you're designing for voice or redundancy, staying in secondary mode is an, a neat trick. Uh, how about five gig? Then you just leave it to the primary. Yeah, yeah. The, that's only if you're dis if that's your requirement. If it's not your requirement, yeah, what are you doing there? So primary requirement, coverage. Secondary requirement, secondary coverage. Yeah, some people call that overlap. But overlap is in people do this little thing. I want this AP to overlap with that AP, and they do this with their hands. Always, when you tell them, they go, overlap, you know. Uh, I actually wrote a white paper on the fallacy of channel overlap. What you're actually after is from the point of view of the client device. The client device says, do I want to see only one AP or do I need to see two? If I do need to see two, do they have to be the same? Like Cisco Voice, 6767, ASCOM Voice, 6773, Avaya Voice, 6572. Whatever those are, then that's your requirement and you come in here and you design to meet the requirement. Now, the third requirement is co-channel interference. Well, how do we measure that? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is fix my channels. <laughs> I'm going to let the software go doodle -doo 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 -doo, and change the channels automatically. Right here, when I first did it, they were on channel one, one, and one. I can manually come in here and say, I don't want channel six. I want this one to be on channel 11. Uh, 52, 64, 44, and so I can switch to, I need to pace my talking more. I can switch to channel overlap, and see in five gig, I set mine, now you can set these a lot of different ways. I like setting mine so that it is, green is no channel, channel overlap, yellow is two on the same channel, and red is three. In two, four, it's sometimes hard to get rid of to get to no co-channel interference, so I might accept yellow. But in five gig, we have more than enough channels, you should not have co-channel interference in five gig. So in two four, how'd I do? I have no co-channel interference. If I only had those three APs, the selected three, I have no co-channel interference. And then you add another AP, you go back to the top, do I have coverage, do I have secondary coverage? Oh, by adding another AP, did it cause co-channel interference? Yes, fix it. Go back to the top, cycle through, cycle through. Design is an iterative process trying to meet all your requirements. Questions? Correct. Uh, can you hold that till tomorrow? I have an actual 10 talk on that very subject. And uh, it's not mine, I, I agree with it, but uh, Devin Aiken wrote it and he sent it to me as a spare in case someone, if we needed to fill in a 10 talk slot. It's about why Wi-Fi has a really difficult time calibrating between devices. The simple answer is, those two NICs aren't calibrated to each other. The, my iPhone and my iPad aren't calibrated to each other. I had an iPhone 6, I took it in to get fixed, I got a new one, they weren't calibrated to each other. They reported two different things. So the best we can hope for is to have a, I don't wanna say average, because it's not average, an on balance iPhone against an on balance NIC. And they're not, they're, it's not, Calibratable because either side's not calibratable. It depends on what the different when you measure. So I have a this one says instructor. Yeah, one of mine. Yeah, it's this one. It broke. It's really sad. But this was my master, and I compared it to my iPhone, compared it to Android phone, and I had this compared. And so if an iPhone was 60B quieter than this, and the iPhone needed 67, this needs a 61. Now, I cheated. 
I would come in here and do something like this. I would make signal strength 61 or whatever my, you know, instead of 67, I put it at 61. And now this picture is showing 61 on this, which would be equal to 67 on an average iPhone. And then after I cut this little picture out of the screenshot, I would slide this back again and cut a picture of this out and then show it to the customer so I didn't have to explain what I just explained to you. You're not supposed to know those things. Now, if you could put that in a template, that would be good template material. Okay, you had enough beers. That was just a teaser. If you really want more, come to an ECSE class. We go over all this stuff and more, a couple days worth. Uh, if not, drink up. We'll see you.